ahead and briefly get us started. Uh, my name is Daniel Danovi, hey, and Daniel. I'm the area coordinator for the DFW ions. Who does not know what the ions is? The sun particles. Okay. <laughs> Light particles, right? Uh, ION stands for the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, our little group here is like a local book club. And we operate under the umbrella of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is based in Petaluma, California. It was started in the early 70s by former astronaut Edgar Mitchell as a way to bridge or create conversations that bridge spirituality and consciousness. So a lot of the things that you've seen come out in our culture are instigated by ions. A lot of the research on uh, extrasensory perception, the consciousness project, the peace project, um, and many, many others. A lot of your leading uh, Bruce Lipton and uh, who are some other people? Craig Braden. Craig Braden. Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra. Uh, Wayne Dyer used to be associated with the ions. It's, and what we do here is we meet the first Sunday of every month to have conversations that make a difference. And that's what I'm especially interested in. I'll give you a brief introduction when I introduce everybody else. Uh, this was meant to be fun and uh, just as an area of inquiry. I don't know how many answers we'll come up with. Uh, each person has uh, their own particular point of view. These are some of the smartest people I know. And he needs to get out more. I, need to, I, need to, I do need to get out more. But uh, my hope is that you'll come away with a lot more questions than answers today. I, when I teach, I, I'm a, a peak performance coach, and I've been uh, studying hypnosis in altered states since I was 13, which has only been a couple years now. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's over 40, and I am enthralled with consciousness, personal reality, our expression in the world, and our connection to all that is. And each person has their own particular point of view. I stand on the foundation that all you know is all you know. And what you don't know, you don't know. You don't know, you don't know it. And a lot of times when things come up in the area that you don't know, you don't know, we automatically make a judgment, oh, that's stupid, or I'm not interested in that. And it's, it's usually because we are not really that familiar with it, or we can't make an immediate connection in our mind. And most of you can probably go back in your history and remember times when you were introduced to a concept and paid no attention to it. Only a few years later to embrace it and adopt it. It's like, oh my God, I wish I would have taken it on then and I would really be a lot further. But you just weren't ready. And I also believe that each time two or more people come together, a third intangible entity is created, is the group mind. Mm -hmm. So as your questions come up, or you have a question that comes up, bring it out. Because you may be the one or the voice for the group. So you're empowered, if you have a question that pops in your head or a perspective you want to know more about, definitely bring it out. So, we'll go ahead and get started. And we're going to start out with just a brief introduction about what you guys are up to before you, you launch into like everything you're up to? No good. <laughs> <laughs> Vaughn, uh, Vaughn Lynn Jones is probably my, uh, my brother from another mother. Uh, we've been connected ever, for the last eight years, ever since I've been in Texas, and had lots of conversations, and he, I like to call him the Grand Poobah of Wizardry. Uh, he's an astrologer, he's been involved in the Kabbalah, uh, most recently, he's been uh, studying transhumanism and the connection between machine or bionics and the human psyche. And now that we're connected to Google, it expands our consciousness even more. Jan Holden, uh, Dr. Jan, she uh, is a professor at UNT. Her specialty is near-death experience and after-death communication. Uh, Jan is our speaker February. 
February, March. February. February, she's going to speak on after-death communication. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask her. Rob Bright, he, is, uh, he leads the empowerment group here at the church uh, on Friday nights, where he investigates law of attraction and empowerment principles. His area of interest is in relationship and personal consciousness, the evolution of personal consciousness. And anything more you want to add to that? I'll let you do that. Yeah. Dr. John Smotherman, uh, his book is over here on the right. He's, he's written the book, The Consciousness Paradigm. He has a unique perspective on personal co uh, consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. His mission is to raise the consciousness of humanity. Shannon Looper, philosopher, he's a, a fellow kindred spirit in world peace and humanity. Uh, he's well couched in quantum physics and computer science, and I'm happy to call my friend. So, uh, before we, I would like the conversation to kind of go in, a, begin with personal consciousness and our personal experience. How do we raise our own consciousness? How do we increase our own personal awareness? And how, how does that relate to our relationships, our immediate relationships? How do they grow our consciousness? And then our, the consciousness of our community. And we'll take it in the end to mass consciousness. I love the idea that, and you'll hear it a lot in popular culture, that we are on the verge of a, a quantum jump in human consciousness. I would like us to explore what the hell does that mean? Like, how is it, what does it look like? What's it sound like? What's it going to feel like to have a jump in consciousness? And will everyone be affected? Or will everyone have access to it? And also, each of you have probably brought some questions with you. So we're going to start out with a brief introduction. Each person will introduce themselves, their perspective, their point of view, so you have an area that you can direct some of your questions to. And we'll go ahead and start out with Vaughn. And I'll have you guys stand up when you speak, uh -huh. so you can uh, talk to the back row. All right, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Vaughn Wood-Jones, as he said. Um, I am currently working on a few different projects. Transhumanism is one of them. Uh, and it's a book that I'm trying to put together for that. That'll be the third one. The first one was Being Human and then Love and Gratitude, both of which are not available at your local bookstore over there. But you can get them on Amazon, so that's okay. Um, what I'm doing right now is two projects. One is transhumanism, where we're looking at all the different things that make us human, how that's going to change as we integrate more artificial parts of our bodies and into our minds. And I'm encouraging people to have the conversation about what makes us human before we start making panicky decisions about things. Because we're good at panicking and leaving things to the last minute and then making stupid rules. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. The other thing I'm working on right now is uh, this app that we recently released called Starmate, which is an astrology program. And what that's about is taking astrology and field research and combining the two. We're finding all kinds of interesting things out. Weird things like, for example, the last 10 presidents have all had Mercury in either a fire or an earth sign. The odds of which are like rolling a coin 10 times and having it land on heads each time. Uh, we found out the five traits for serial killers. And oh, that's interesting. Yes, it is. <laughs> and we've also found out, found out some interesting information about people physically, um, which I'm not going to go into right here, but some of it you really want to know. More. So there's that. Um, and what else do I do? Um, strategic consulting for um, various people. And uh, try and spend as little time as possible doing anything of any real value. Um, other than drinking alcohol. That's it. That's me, I, I do like your perspective when you apply the Kabbalah to it. Yeah, the, so the Kabbalah is a, is a long conversation, but in short, Kabbalah is a, is a paradigm used in Jewish mysticism. Some of you are familiar with it. It's also the basis for most tarot decks. The Kabbalah looks at the universe um, through a series of spheres called Sephiroth and the paths between them. And you can take any aspect of the human psyche and trace it through that and see what happens next and you know there's all kinds of ways to explore it but it's, it's an interesting tool and there's a whole story about it and I'd love to do one of the old presentations I'll be used to on it at some point in the future but we'll see so and consciousness 
relation to that. So anyway, that's me. Yes. I just got a, a real quick question. With your research, do you use any uh, artificial intelligence at this point, like Watson or something? Oh, okay, I think so. You're using the artificial sti uh, stimulants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have some software that we use that does pattern matching. Like find, Watson? Uh, no, it. I just call her Sheila. But, um, okay. It's, it's just it's our own software. So okay. Just cool. Cool. Yes, we'll learn. Okay, thank you. Jan Holden. I'm Jan Holden. I am a professor of counseling at the University of North Texas. And I guess as an academic, I'm uh, very interested in uh, empirical research on phenomena that um, relate to consciousness, the nature of consciousness, and um, how to access consciousness to facilitate the greatest good for humanity. So um, I've been interested primarily in near-death experiences and after-death communication, as, as Daniel said, and in particular a phenomenon called veridical perception. And that's where in the experience, the person gains knowledge of something that was impossible for them to have otherwise known, but then later is verified as being accurate. And so I'll probably talk about some cases of that in both near-death experiences and after-death communication. Um, and for me, those, ex those kinds of experiences um, really address the question of whether transpersonal experiences, which are those that transcend the usual limits of space or time, are um, merely the workings of, of a subjective mind or whether they uh, actually are objective experiences. Um, and if research can show that they're objective, then it uh, lends credibility to the experiences and what those experiences then tell us about not only the nature of consciousness, but meaning and purpose in life. So those are my interests. Before I let Rob talk, <coughs> Quick poll, how many of you have had a transpersonal experience where you've left your body or you've had an out-of-body experience? Where Does LSD count? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Not really. I, I know I have had one and Rob has had one. Have you guys? Yes? Yes? Okay. So I really want to explore that and what it means to have a transpersonal experience and what it does to your perception of consciousness. What it has, what it means to your relationship uh, to your body and the rest of your life, what uh, now is now consideration. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Bright. That happens to be my interest. It's transpersonal experiences. So my, uh, I had a transformational ex uh, personal experience as I'm learning the term over the years. I used to uh, consider it my out of ego or sidestepping the ego, and. Um, my experience happened in the early 70s and profoundly changed my life and it affects me every day because it changed. It was a big paradigm change. And, uh, and life continues to uh, have paradigm changes. I, I consider enlightenment versus, versus enlightenment. So in other words, it's always kind of expanding, expanding. You don't know what you don't know until you know something different. So paradigms. So. Um, I specialize in personal uh, coaching and teaching a uh, class every Friday night up here at the Center for Spiritual Living upstairs. And it's all about empowerment, and I call my group an empowerment. And my coaching, empowered coaching, it's I spelled with an I-N, and it means uh, authentic empowerment from the inside out. So from my early days, of, I had my transformation experience around my, when I was 18, it peaked around my 19th birthday. And from that time on, I've tried to integrate my new perspectives into my day-to-day -day life. And in the beginning, I lived life somewhat uh, isolated uh, so I could s stay centered within myself. And I mean, not I'd be around people, but I'm saying emotionally, psychologically somewhat, therefore I wouldn't have to get caught up in the ego perspective. So my lifelong journey has been to integrate those perspectives, my humanness, my, who, who I am as a person and that broader part of me that's in every one of us, individualized, how to do that better and at the same time uh, help other people on that same path. So people that have these experiences or new ways of seeing things can kind of help other people. 
And uh, so I've worked on, over the years, uh, reverse engineering my experience and insights and interpretations in ways that are very practical. So I'm really into, I would say, uh, uh, spiritual psychology. And I have some uh, models I'll talk about later, <coughs> kind of explaining what goes on in a trans uh, personal experience. Okay. Dr. John Swarman. Mm -hmm. Question? What? There's a question there. Do you want questions now or later? Uh, if you could hold your question until we I'll go through the introductions, just a couple more, and then we can go to, into questions. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm a combination of two things, basically um, a philosopher and a pragmatist, and I've studied consciousness pretty much all of my life. I, my interest in it began when I was in <coughs> junior high, and I started out surveying religion and philosophy and psychology, and I, mean, I just went through one field after another. But my, my central question that I was pursuing was, what's basically, what's the meaning of life, and how do we get the most out of life? How do we be the happiest that we can be? So that's my philosopher side, and then on the other side, I'm a lawyer, I practice family law. And that's my pragmatic side, and I, I, in family law, I see over and over and over again, people having lower consciousness challenges that create real downers for their life. Uh, makes them very unhappy, strains their relationships, makes it difficult for the kids, makes it difficult to process um, life experiences and interactions with other people. and so. Well, on the one hand, I kept seeing these pragmatic problems of people really having challenges in life that weren't necessary. And then, on the other hand, this kind of idealistic view of why are we here to begin with and what's the meaning of all this. And then I've tried to bring those two together, which is figure out what basically is the meaning of life, what makes us happy, and then pragmatically, okay, well, knowing that's great, but how do we, how do we systematically implement that in our lives so that we can basically consciously choose to evolve ourselves if that's what we want to do and reap the benefits from it and, and the benefits are great um, I could go on and on I've got a very long list I can tell you but but the short and the simple of it is I think the higher your consciousness the happier you are it, it pretty much pulls down to that so that's that's what I'm pursuing <coughs> all right <coughs> so where to start yeah. so uh, John and I actually are on like Listening to him talk, I'm like, wow, that's what I would say about me. Um, I guess when I was real little, nine or ten years old, the stuff that people were telling me was real, didn't seem like really good explanations. Uh, so at that point, it kind of caught my <coughs> my imagination, my attention. Is like, so what is reality? And if there's been one underlying path, it's been to try to answer that question. So the first time I went to college, I majored in physics because I grew up in the 60s. And, you know, Einstein was the guy, right? It was like, this is the most intellectual person we've ever had. Uh, and he was a physicist. So I thought, oh, the physicists know everything about reality. So I started majoring in physics. And <clears throat> I guess about the second year, I ended up taking a class in cosmology. It was a symposium, so I didn't have to do anything, just listen. Uh, but it was all the cutting edge physics. And so then I got, oh, so if this is where the cutting edge is, they don't know either. Uh, and so I got out, uh, started, I was raised in a very uh, conservative Christian religion, but I started questioning that too. So I studied, like John, religion, psychology, uh, philosophy came way later, but uh, just anything I could get my hands on. And I kind of, I kind of followed this path of here's what I know, and then I see something, and it kind of makes sense with what I know, and so then I'll go jump into that subject, right? And then I'll kind of, like, I want to get the purity of that. So, like, uh, well, I don't know. So I just, I, I, I kind of have this purist thing. So I'll jump into that until I really understand exactly what that thing is on its own, and then see how it relates to other stuff and what I can take and add to my overall worldview. And so I've kind of just gone from this thing to that thing to that thing and kind of like I've been led on a path, right? So physics, so and one of the things is like I've never abandoned, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ken Wilber, he talks about transcend and include, so I don't throw away stuff that I've already learned that was valuable, right? But when I get new stuff, then I try to expand my horizons, right? And add that too, but don't throw away anything from before. 
So my physics background keeps me kind of grounded in this, okay, so let's kind of make sure things stay a little rational where they could get kind of off the track. So like, uh, you know, looking for that empirical evidence to back up these experiences, right? Um, and so recently I've been, uh, I spent like seven years studying ontology, which is the study of being, which is kind of like a walking meditation, like self-awareness at a really deep level so you can notice, oh, I'm having a reaction to this. So those processes and that kind of training really increased my awareness, I think. Um, and then really recently it's been uh, Spiral Dynamics and Ken Wilber's work, and it's just whatever I can grab to like, enhance my own awareness. And then how can we, just like John said, how can we take that understanding and present it to everybody else where it's relatable and people can actually use it and we can increase awareness on the planet. And the reason I think that's important is because the more aware we are, not only are we happier, but the less conflict there is, the less need to dominate people, uh, and the world gets better for everybody. At least that's my opinion. Just a little bit more about me. Uh, I think we've run out of time. <clears throat> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you guys that you are purist in uh, studying different disciplines. I'm like, I have a physics book over here, a philosophy book over here. Oh, yeah, let me pick this health book. And <laughs> so it's like I've always been like in a lot of, had my hands on a lot of different subjects at any given one time. Any one time? I started exploring hypnosis when I was 13 and became very enthralled with the whole aspect of trance and personal reality. I have come to, to feel that our experience as a human being is really just a play of consciousness. That there's very little of it that's real. In the Hindu culture it's referred to as Maya. And that the grand seduction is that our day-to-day -day concerns are what life is really about. I think that's just to keep us busy while we learn other things. I've been meditating since I was 13 and became a formal meditator when I was 28. And that has led to some mystical experiences of its own. Uh, I really, uh, the, our thoughts, we're not our thoughts. What goes on in our mind isn't really that important in the end. And this is, for the most part, an intellectual conversation and realize that whatever is here, John uses this, you know, a, a metaphor of the wise men uh, touching, or the blind men mm -hmm. touching an elephant for the first time. And one is touching the trunk and says, this is a tree. And one is, has his hands up against the side and says, no, it's a wall. And one has his hand on the tail and says, it's a rope. And so each of us have our own perspective and none of it's the truth. It's just, our, a lot of it's our experience, is what we've come to learn, and we've put it together in our own unique way. So again, if you're, if you're looking for answers, you probably won't find them, but hopefully we can introduce you to some new concepts, and just to expand your area of personal inquiry.